So uh, here we go. All right. So this is just getting set up right now. It's going to go live in just one moment. So uh, oh, it is live. OK. Uh, yes, yeah. sir. As a matter of fact, I believe it is live right now. So uh, I want to welcome everybody to the program. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I did do a brief promo uh, on one of the Preterist Forums this afternoon. We've got a very important discussion tonight. It's going to be uh, Mark Smith, who is a well-known writer, uh, speaker, debater. Uh, he did a debate, I think, a couple of weeks ago with Don K. Preston. It was an excellent debate. And we also have Dr. Samuel Frost. He's well known amongst uh, preterist within preterist circles, uh, within um, eschatological and scholarly circles. He's written quite a number of books. I uh, used to be a, a full preterist like myself, and uh, he left the movement, and now he writes on uh, theology, eschatology, and related issues. We well, welcome both gentlemen to the show. Uh, how are you? Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Not yeah. a problem. And As a matter of fact. Uh, I want to, I guess, I guess what we could do is do this. I guess we could let, since there's uh, two of you, I guess we could let Mark, I guess you could open up and just explain a little background about yourself. And then we could, uh, we could move to Sam and then we can kind of bounce around the room a little bit. How does that sound? Oh, uh, that, that sounds good enough. Uh, my background, I was a member of the true church uh, for many years Uh and I, I found out from Lance that he didn't know what that was, that that's a non-instrumental church of Christ. Oh, okay. Uh, and of a particular slant, of course, not all of the non-instrumental churches of Christ are the true church. Anyway, uh, grew up uh, in that, and that church specializes in throwing stones at all the other churches. So I, I was discussing and debating religion as a young teenager against uh, Pentecostal ministers, Baptists, Bap uh, Mormon elders, whatever. Uh, that was all fine and good until I realized that a lot of the arguments I was making to these people when I applied them to myself, uh, they, I was starting to get embarrassed. And so I ended up uh, becoming more liberal in my thinking, uh, became a uh, universalist. Uh, everybody's getting saved, and the 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 fiery death is only for a short, you know, day or minute or whatever, you know, just sort of like a formality. But after that, you go to heaven. Uh, in my mid thirties, I pursued a study on the second coming. I had been meaning to do that since I was a uh, teenager. Uh, I was going to intensively study either the second coming or the Trinity. I picked the second coming. Uh, six months later, I was basically uh, a non-Christian. Uh, that's not where I predicted I was going to end up at. That wasn't my intention at all. Uh, but I had to be honest with the evidence. Uh, this was before computers. Uh, I basically did the whole thing on three by five cards and sheets of paper, laid it out on my living room floor. Uh, these arguments seem to support Jesus as a true prophet of God. And these arguments seem to support him as a false prophet. Mm -hmm. And the more I studied, all those three by five cards ended up on the false prophet side. And uh, I just had to go with the evidence. So uh, I, I wasn't an atheist at that time, but I definitely wasn't a Christian. I, I checked into Judaism a bit, uh, saw issues with that. Uh, eventually, I, I became an agnostic and then evolved into an atheist. And it, it would probably take a heck of a lot to get me back into a Christian mindset at this point. There's just, you know, the life's like the dam's broken and there's way too many things, even beyond the second coming stuff. So I, I label myself as an evangelical atheist. Um, I have a website, I have a Facebook page called uh, Fault Line. Uh, any Christians listening, we need more Christians. Facebook, Fault Line. Google it, whatever. Please join. And uh, anyway, that's uh, my basic story. Okay. 
Sounds sounds good. Sounds like a good testimony. And I'm sorry, sorry to hear you might have had some some uh, you know bad experience with religion. Some people, you know, some people have those. Um, and of course, I'm sure you were looking at evidence in as objective a sense as possible as well. So it's not like you were being subjective. We're going to assume that you were being objective. Uh, Sam, how about yourself? I know that you have uh, quite a bit of background, extensive knowledge in this sort of thing. Uh, do you have any, any comments to that? Or is there anything you'd like to say regarding yourself and your own journey through the faith? Um, well, I've been in The church that Jesus Christ said that he would build, um, not my church, his church, and uh, most of my life I was raised, I've been in church all my life, um, raised four square gospel, um, went through the 70s, late 80s, uh, charismatic movement, um, you know, witnessed all of that, always a, always a, uh, you know, I was the kid that in school that had the Jesus coloring book. So I was always interested in Jesus. I was always interested in that. That drew me very young age. Um, so, uh, you know, like my mom likes to retell the story when I was six. What I wanted for Christmas was one of those big poppy table family Bibles with the picture in it, you know, that kind of thing. And I still actually have that. I have my children's Bible too because that's another thing that i wanted so i you know just always loved church um so four square gospel you go to charismatic movement that's early 80s um my stepfather was a contractor for holiday Inn, so we moved around a lot and so i went to a lot of different churches and my stepfather was seventh day adventist and wonderful uh, man that i miss i miss very much um and my mom, of course, was is four square gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal in that from that vein. And my dad was more of a kind of an antinomian Methodist, you know. So I, I had these flavorings and I would grow up watching my mom and stepfather who dearly, dearly loved each other. Um, but they would be arguing about gifts of the spirit, not gifts of the spirit. So I, that's the kitchen table kind of stuff. But I grew up. <laughs> Grew up with that. So there was a love there between them, but yet they were also arguing. So I, I <laughs> looking back on it, um, I, I, I think that affected me very early on that you can argue and sharply disagree and yet still love one another. That's That was the lesson that was taught to me. So I thought, okay, well, that's how that works. And go to college, of course. Um, you're exposed to everything as you should be. Uh, a millennial, premillennial, you know, the whole nine yards, and met a couple of wonderful mentors there that took me under their wings. There, I was exposed to postmillennialism, preterism, and Josephus, and um, the history of Reformation. You know, big world. Uh, God, God became much bigger in college, and when you grow up in some of these places. Um, because I still remember that very vividly. This is 85 to 89. So you, you grow up in a cloistered kind of thing, and then you go to college, you're exposed, and you're like, oh, I didn't realize church was this big and that there were this many churches, that there was, like, this is massive. Um, and then 2,000 years, so it goes on. And then the divergencies of views. So you really, you know, just take try to take all of that in. So I love church history. Uh, fell in love with all of that, did my languages, um, and went down a preterist, post-millennial thing, reading very, very early on, uh, working at the bookstore there on the campus, and with distance education, so I was blocked in with what was coming out and what was hot, and we were getting stuff from Tyler, Texas, Dominion Press, uh, Ray Sutton, James Jordan, David B. Chilton. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Gary DeMar, uh, David Chilton, Gary Norris. Uh, you're reading Rush Dooney. You're reading all of this stuff. So just really devouring um, all of that. And I became a bibliophile at the time, too, addicted to books. I still am addicted to books. <laughs> it's an addiction. It's a disease is what it is. 
It's true. <laughs> we passed by a rummage sale or a good. Oh, it's a Goodwill. <laughs> they got books in there. Um, no, that's me too. So <laughs> that brought about, um, you know, the Preterist view, <clears throat> which and I don't like these labels. It's just it's the association of first century Second Temple Judaism studies, first century studies, Josephus, uh, Tacitus. You're so you're doing all of this. Stuff. And of course, 70 AD is figures in too. Um, so with the preterist view, it's a it's a question of how much in this slot over here um, do, do you pour the Bible into? You know, what has been fulfilled, what is now being fulfilled in our lifetime, what shall be fulfilled? Those are the three slots. Well, preterism kind of filled this first slot in with all the Bible. They were just throwing everything. And I went down that path with a vengeance. Um, and became a, a full preterist. And then around 1999, 2000, um, I met Max and Tim King. And, uh, and now I had known Max before previously through phone conversations. Here I just met, I actually met him at an RC Sproul conference in Orlando. And that is where it took off because I was again doing my studies. And C. Jonathan Soraya wrote a book against full preterism about church history and sola scriptura and creeds and all of that and i took sh shot a shot at that uh, with misplaced hope that book and max king and tim king published that one. so that then the next thing i know i'm being asked at all of these full preterist conferences to speak uh i'm just a hick kid from indiana i don't know <laughs> but i'm being asked so and i'm in this full preterist movement and you know, paying for my room and board to speak. Yeah, I'll, I'll go speak. Um, and so this full preterist thing really takes off. And that's where I met Lance. Mm -hmm. Way, way, way back. And Brian. Yeah. Um, so we're going back a few years. <laughs> so, you know, very involved with that. Started the church there in St. Petersburg. One of the few, I think you can count how many churches, Lance, full preterist churches. Maybe you can count them on your hands and toes. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> ten. A lot of them. Um, so amazing such a great yeah. movement. church of christ which max king's like fifth generation church of christ mm -hmm. not preston's like fifth generation so i'm not church of that's neither was i least familiar with the not study denominations and seminary and all that stuff you do your work church of christ was one of the least denominations but i knew about stone and campbell and of course 19th century so you, you really see where all that come at, comes out of and as a pentecostal four square some of that pigeons into where our Pentecostal history. So that that restoration of the gifts, restoration of original, all that stuff kind of going along. There. So there's that established my kind of independency. But then I, as a budding scholar theologian, you also have to deal with all of this this material. Um, and so full preterism was it until I started noting some problems. Right. Uh, some some I just you know. You, Mark, as a you know scholar, you always have that voice in the back of your head, even when you're confident of something saying you could be wrong. Keep 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 turning the wheels here. You know you don't know everything. You're not omniscient. Um, so you keep pushing that, and I started finding some holes. And fortunately, I had a wonderful mentor, Dr. Kenneth Talbot, um, who was fanning some of that flame. <laughs> And then when I finally found a, a really serious problem with full preterism, uh, he really fanned it. And he said, yeah, you've got a problem here. And then I had to walk away from my reputation and what I had built. I had built a whole ministry and speaking engagements and the whole uh, selling books and CDs and teaching commentaries and all this stuff. Um, we were hosting debates with Don Preston and James Jordan and Thomas Ice. And Mark Hitchcock, I mean, we were having some big names come into our church. And I had to give all that up because I found some problems. And it was very, it was very crushing um, for me. I found a little bit of a friend in Jim Bean for a while. And because I didn't know what to do. So me and Jim got along pretty well. Well, we did. <laughs> yeah. I, so that where I'm at now has caused me to go back, reevaluate the uh constituent elements of what is Nicene Creed, what binds the church together, regardless of all of these differences, denominations, sects that we have. 
there is that there is that unity and, and resurrection and we shall look forward we look forward to the life in the age to come resurrection is future bodily resurrection the 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 set all of those things took on a whole more full um meaning for me now going back reading now uh, like nt wright and j Creston becker and um jürgen moltmann and all of these guys who so really going back and reevaluating now um just at the place i'm more confident in in my faith than i ever have been i'm probably the opposite of, of mr smith um going through all of this stuff and yet still coming out on the other side and lance and brian too they went through a skeptical period where you're just deconstructing every thing around you because i i was telling frost but anyway day, that's my thing so yeah yeah i mean i was telling frost the other day mark i was like uh you know me and because you were on derek's uh myth vision podcast yes. like like me and also an ex-preterist so yeah, yeah, me, yeah me derek, derek, we derek. like me and derek we've gone through like almost the exact same path the only difference is he went you know his route and i went eastern yep. orthodox i mean honestly mm-hmm. like and I've heard this told about me, like, oh, you sound like Derek. I'm like, well, Derek has some good points when he talks about full preterism and its flaws. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> you know, I think Derek's a nice guy, but, uh, you know, sure. yeah. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I can totally understand, like, you, you're you looking at uh, full preterism and you're just like, mm, yeah, I think this is a stupid f- failed doomsday cult. I mean, if you buy into it that way, I mean, because I did for like two years, I was I was messaging Frost all the time, like, dude, I think I'm just going to quit Christianity. He's like, you should. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, eh, I think I will. But Eastern Orthodoxy, I found a place there and it just uh, my faith was restored in Christ because of it. But that's my story. So that's, that's not alone, it. too. We've witnessed quite a bit of. Yeah. Full I, just want to say, I knew back 2005, 2006. They're now full blown atheists. They're just completely, oh, yeah, just yeah. completely fell apart. And I'm like, boy. just briefly, yeah, just briefly for for me, I think I don't. I wouldn't say that I actually went through a skeptical period. I was skeptical in that. Remember, I was only a full preterist for 15 months. So I started, you know, within a year of me getting into it, I started seeing. Wait a minute, this stuff doesn't add up. And uh, like yourself, Mark, I went through a period where I was a universalist, and then I began believing that. Well, after AD 70, all truth is subjective. So it was objective Hmm. until AD 70. Now it's subjective. So it's not how how you perceived Christ or religion um, objectively. It's how you perceive it, you know, um, subjectively. So the truth could be, you know, whatever it means for you. And then I finally figured, well, this doesn't really work. But I think the, um, you know, I came, I was lucky enough to come across some really fall upon some really good books that were written by some um, some men who really knew what they were talking about within about a year uh, after I had um, I had left full preterism, and they really restored my faith. And I, I learned a lot from you know from typology, from the correlation and correspondence of the types of, in scripture. I really really restored my um, you know whatever uh, of my faith was was flagging. Really restored it because I said, well. If this is the New Testament is just a made up story, they had to have the most they had to be the most, have the most superhuman cunningness to devise and to take all of these types and all of these histories and all of these stories and weave them back into the narrative. Uh, I was uh, mentioning the other day, you know, the story of Cain being banished after killing his brother. I came across a book um, by I.M. Haldeman called How to Study the Bible or How to Enjoy the Bible. And uh, he said, well, Cain's a type of the Jews. The Jews killed their brother, uh, Jesus, and afterwards they were banished, condemned to wander the earth, but Mark was put on him. uh, No one was permitted to kill him. The Jews haven't been destroyed in 2,000 years. God will take vengeance on anyone who tries to destroy the Jews. I said, well, somebody knew something about that when they wrote the New Testament. Somebody knew something about those garden evictions and those uh, those early uh, narratives. So they weaved it back into the story. So I said, well, maybe it's false. If it is false, but somebody knew what they were doing in taking those stories as an artist and weaving them into a new narrative uh, so that there's co- coherency and consistency. But that mm-hmm. to me is evidence because it's uh, it's an, it's analogous to nature, where when you look at something under a microscope or you look at nature, a production, a plant uh, or an animal or, or anything, and you see such a, a correlation of um, 
of the most minutest particulars uh, agreeing and so supporting the nourishment and well-being uh, of the whole. It's uh, something that only God can do. It's a kind of work that only a supreme being can do or a supreme intelligence, let's just leave it on the table, at that could do. And that's mm -hmm. my story. I like, well, I like I, that phrase, garden evictions. Oh, <laughs> I, like. I, I have more respect for people that have changed their mind on religion than I do for somebody that grew up a Baptist, yeah. got married as a Baptist, retired as a Baptist, and got buried in a Baptist cemetery. Uh, the one thing that changing your religion proves is, number one, you have an open mind. And number two, you're willing to look at the evidence. And number three, you're willing to follow that evidence regardless of the cost. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because leaving a particular religion, it's not... A lot of atheists think it's no big deal. Uh, what's the problem? You know, this is false. Why can't you just leave it all? For a Christian to leave his particular denomination, much less the religion entirely, that can involve losing all of your friends, mm -hmm. getting a divorce, uh, having your children turn against you. Uh, yeah. If you're a minister, now you got to look for a place to live. You lose your employment. You lose your career. I mean, it's not an easy decision. And it's not one that's uh, come at lightly. So I, I respect all of you gentlemen for that. I, th I think that's important. I mean, there's a, you know, not academia, research studies, and, and that you always want to keep you know, an open mind. And of course, you know, you can keep an open mind where you don't believe you, know, you have to land, come down firm somewhere. Mm -hmm. But there's always that uh, push of, of research. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that there's a voice that's challenging you always. So I, at least that's the way I was mentored is to always challenge even your own, you know, const constantly challenge even your own presuppositions, your own, and yeah. at least, if nothing else, realize your own bias. Then you can right. say, yeah, of course I'm this way or I'm this way or this, that, and the other. And that at least frees you up to have a, to have a conversation. And I know many full predators are listening to this and saying, well, why don't you leave your futurism, you know, and come into the, but, but, but we did. And I don't, I'm not angry with people changing their minds. I'm not angry with people who used to believe in tongues and now they don't, or people who don't believe in tongues and now they do. I, that's, to me, growing up around all this, and I'll be 56 this year, um, and seeing all of these different types of things, I came to the realization that I'm not God. I don't understand all this. I, But he does. And that's, it's his problem. It's, it's not my problem to get everybody to line up with, with, with what I'm with what I'm doing. That's going to come out in the end, in, in my thinking. That will be resolved. That will come out in the end. And then we have this thing called grace, you know, and mercy with where we're at, and in our studies. And as as, as we all here know, um, you know, we're not omniscient. I don't know everything. So when I'm in the church, though, I try to build a consensus. Well, what does the Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodoxy, Pentecostals, Baptist Church, what do we all, we're, rather than attacking where we all disagree, why not start with where we agree? And the best place, there's what grew out and became um, called the Apostles' Creed. That's one of the earliest, earliest statements. And then you, you, you go and you read the earliest church fathers, regardless, and they're all Look, they're not uniform. Um, second century fathers are not in a uniformity uh, by any, you know, they are picking and jabbing. And then you get to the origin, he's picking and jabbing at everybody. And they're all picking and jabbing at him. And he's orthodox. Well, to an extent. Well, yeah. <laughs> to an extent. <laughs> yeah. So that's, there's a freedom going on there, a, a liberal freedom that's going, but yet at the same time, I believe God is building 
also he's building something and it so are there points of light of agreement and that's where i started really focusing and remarkably there is i can look at lance and say he's a brother in christ uh, i'm not eastern orthodox you know he is but that him being eastern orthodox and me not being a presbyterian um that doesn't bother me i don't have to I don't have to convince Lance that he has to be a Calvinist and a Presbyterian or he's not going to heaven. Uh, yeah. uh, and Lance could even object to that. Uh, and where I'm at now <laughs> in my years, I, I just, I'm okay with that because I'm not God. I can't change a soul. I don't know how to change people. I don't have that kind of power or persuasiveness or anything else. All I can do is just make some good, uh, arguments, Sam, some good arguments. Sam, I, I want to, let you know that I'm jealous of all your books behind you. Uh, 30, out of years, I'm years. not allowed to put my books out out of deference to my fundamentalist Christian wife. My oh, books yeah. are in exile in boxes in our garage. Oh no, that's the worst place. I know. Oh, I have a downstairs that's that my wife says that. If the upstairs is mine and I can do whatever I want to upstairs, and I said, yeah, <laughs> because the uh, downstairs is yours. And I'm like, you got it. Knowing Frost's wife, that's pretty funny to me to hear. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. So she has the upstairs. <laughs> Kimberly. Paint, it, paint it whatever you want to, purple. Uh, now, I, Down here I'm, I was really surprised at the impact of my debate with Don Preston. Uh, yeah. I was thinking maybe 50 people would tune in to see it. Uh, there aren't that many predators to start with. Why would they be interested in even in this debate, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, there was that debate. Uh, I think the viewers ship is up to like seven and a half thousand already on the video. And there's been two discussion videos about the debate since mm -hmm. then. Uh, I, I am totally shocked. Uh, one thing I have picked up on, though, it wasn't just me and Derek that left Christianity with uh, preterism being the last stop. Uh, <clears throat> could you uh, men discuss uh, the apparent fact that there are people that preterism is the last lifeboat to jump into and they end up leaving the religion altogether? Because apparently there's more people that have done that than I was aware of. Yeah. yeah so, and, uh, you know, the, the thing is, with, with the way I look at it, Mark, is it's uh, preterism is a deconversion <clears throat> uh, paradigm. So it's, it's and this, this is why when I left full preterism, what I did was there's a lot of people when they leave full preterism, they end up either retreating to some nondescript form of uh, gray area preterism or they end up branching off to some totally different thing. What I did was I went back and I retraced my steps because I realized that what you, what you do before you become a preterist is you have to basically, you have to ignore, uh, unlearn everything that you've learned. So it's a deconversion process that takes place. It's a deconversion process. And so if you're gonna, if you're gonna go back, if you're gonna leave full preterism, there's only two places to go. You're either gonna go out the exit door or you're going to, uh, you're going to have to go back, find out where you went off the rails, find out where you went off the high road, get back on it and continue where you were. So I was, uh, you know, I was in the independent uh, Baptist church and uh, then I became a five point Calvinist. And then, of course, I started reading preterist literature. Well, anyways, I ended up going back all the way back to where I began and I took everything that I learned, all the good things with me. But I had to I had to kind of unlearn what I had unlearned, if that makes any sense. But you're right, because it's a deconversion process. So if you're going to you know, say, well, Jesus Christ died to save the world. And somebody says, well, the world doesn't mean it means that the Roman world, it means the the Jewish world. Well, you've got to unlearn, you know, you've got to, you know, you're um, you've got to uh, fundamentally change your understanding of laws of language, which is a point that you brought up in your debate with Don Preston is mm. a fundamental difference in, lang in language meaning and language understanding. So the way I look at it is if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're gonna deconvert to preterism, then the next stop from there is not going to be something you know more 
uh, I guess, closer to, to Christianity. It's going to be a purer form of Christianity. It's going to be a more corrupt form of Christianity, uh, even considered as orthodox. It's going to be more corrupt form. And of course, it's going to lead you to more and more, uh, I guess, uh, you know, divergent uh, views, because now I'm starting to hear things from full preterists about, you know, textual criticism and stuff and all this kind of stuff. Oh, these guys, borrowed, this guy borrowed from that guy. This guy. You know, where I learned it, you know, in the Baptist church, you know, plenary inspiration, you start leaving those foundations, yep. you can go all over the place. And atheism sometimes seems like the most logical option for some people. At least for me, Mark, um, I, I mean, I kind of saw like Derek did back because I know that Derek has said before, like he was trying to save Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And back in back, like back when I was a because I I was originally I started out as a partial preterist because I read R.C. Sproul and I was like, this guy knows what he's talking about, uh, eschatology wise. So I was like, all right, this this makes sense. Well, I kept thinking like, oh, I need to save Jesus because I saw like flaws in in the way that some of the preterists were going. So I was like, all right, I need to be consistent. And so I went down the full preterist path and, and Frost can, Frost can attest to this. Cause I would always tell him when he was an, when Frost went ex full preterist, cause I was against him at one point, I was like, what are you doing Frost? We're trying to save Jesus because the atheists are going to win if, if, um, if, if full preterism isn't true. And, you know, the problem was though, I eventually couldn't save Jesus because full preterism full ran to these flaws and stuff. So, um, but, but at least for me, I started to realize that, well, I, I really was going at like, I was going from a lens that I was like, I was looking at the tree, but there's a whole forest there. And I think that uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I think that a lot of people, they're not looking at the entire tree like i think they're just looking at the forest and i don't think that they're ignorant i think it's just you don't know what you don't know sometimes so at least for me when i started i was when i was going through a faith crisis i was like this is my last boat i don't know what to do now because i was looking yeah. into i was looking into judaism i was like man maybe i should just go be a viking you know <laughs> go back to my pagan roots as as a conley you know um mm -hmm. a, maybe the Gaelic Gaelic gods or something. But um, at the end of the day, I was told, Lance, stop being, a, stop being an idiot. Go read the church fathers. And I'm like, who are these church fathers? So I'm reading them. And the more I read them, you know, intellectually, it made sense. But on a just, you know, a, I guess a spiritual, experiential whatever way i mean it, it just came i came to the conclusion that well if saint polycarp isn't lying to me and if saint ignatius isn't lying to me and if saint clement is the real clement from philippians 4 well then it seems like john died in 100 a.d in the reign of trajan seems like all the full preterists are wrong about their early dating um so I just started to conclude that, you know, maybe maybe the church fathers weren't right on, on everything, which nobody is, but maybe they had a point. Maybe maybe this yeah, makes more let, sense. Let, than, me, let, let, let me ask you a question as long as we're on the church fathers. Right. Uh, Preston didn't respond to my point. That, he never will, but yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, according, it, in my limited knowledge of preterism, according all the Christians were removed from the earth in 70 AD. According to Ed how Stewart, do we get yeah. the church fathers then? I mean, <laughs> yeah, if, that's a good if, question. If you got if you removed all the Buddhists today from earth, that religion's probably dead. It's, it's, it's gone. Yeah. If you remove Christianity in 70 AD, who the hell were these church fathers? Excuse my French. Who the hell? There we go. Okay. Who were these church fathers? And exactly. how did the religion survive? No, I've, I've asked Don these same questions, and he's always like, Lance is an idiot. He's an antichrist for even asking this question. Like, okay. Um, yeah, I mean. No, that doesn't answer the question. It doesn't. It's just a deflection. There's, there's two schools, and there's two de raging debates within this small movement, as you've noted, um, that could only be birthed in a Protestant restorationist, me and my Bible mentality 
Uh, yeah. Me, Jesus, and the Bible have the whole world figured out. We don't need the past. We don't need creeds. We don't need theologians. We don't need scholars. We don't need just me, Jesus, and the Bible, and we'll figure it all out. Um, that's the mentality. You'll never see full preterism in Eastern Orthodoxy or Roman Catholicism. Mm -hmm. It didn't come out of there. It came out of American soil, I think, primarily American soil. Well, do and they that, have because of that independency? Yeah, that just indie, strong independence. Um, and I get to decide what the text says. I don't care what Polycarp or uh, uh, mm -hmm. Karl Barth says. Who's Karl Barth? Who cares? Um, well, you should care. He, he, massive impact on the 20th century. Me, on the other hand, I've not had a massive impact on the 20th century. So, you know, you pay attention to these guys. So reading the, so, so anyway, the debate is, uh, there's uh, Ed Stevens. He's a prominent um Mark, and you may have heard of him in your in your study. Yeah. Yeah. So he believes a literal rapture in 70 AD. Hardly any full preterists went down that route. There is a pocket of them, um, and we call them the the immortal body at death view. The IBVs. IBV, yeah. yeah. So that's the camp. It's actually become a camp. There's God's a view is the corporate body view, where Don does not believe that Christians were raptured. It doesn't have the uh, death does not have anything to do with biology. Um, resurrection doesn't have anything to do with biology. It has nothing to do with earth, organisms, or biology, anything. It's purely, um, and Don was a, Don and I were like this. Don still publishes my book, um, Essays on the Resurrection. Even though for us, he'll sell, it's not, yeah, he'll sell the, he'll one of the best books ever written on full preterism. <laughs> I've asked him not to sell it, but he still does. Um, <laughs> but Don and I were, cl were, were close and lectured together and did a lot of stuff. So mm -hmm. his, his view is purely, uh, we used to have a joke. It's not a tissue issue. It's a covenant issue. That, that's how... So 70 AD was a statement from God that he accepts you on the basis of faith alone and that a new era, apart from the old covenant age, the new covenant age has now come. So it has nothing to do with biology. It has nothing to do with history ending. It has nothing to do with physical death. It doesn't have anything. It has everything to do with your covenant yeah. standing. Okay, so that's the majority. Man, so, Phil may or Brian, you may agree with it. I, but from my going through conferences and meeting, tends to be the majority half of it, but it is split. The, the group is split. On that. So, to sum it up, um, Ed Stevens does have this rapture view, and he his answer is that the uh, that everybody was raptured, and somehow, some way, the apostates that were left behind. Yeah. They decided to preserve the text and um, they preserved it great. And now it's people that are Christians today can still be Christians today, which, you know, it doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, no. These apostates no. are like, oh, yeah, no. that's great. Let's keep these scriptures and not mess them up or anything. <laughs> Even like, though we okay. don't understand a word of them. No, I, and I, I, get, I get why Ed Stevens doesn't want to ever have a discussion with me now, but um. Yeah, Don Preston, he doesn't have that. He's just like, oh, everything is spiritual. Everything happens spiritually. And, and I'm going to put covenant on it. Yeah. I'm going to put I, covenant I did. I, I, I must pat myself in the back, though. I did provide photographs showing the things that Don claimed were happening. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning of my debate, those photographs of oh, yeah. Jesus returning and the angels and all that. Yep. So you, you can't argue with the photograph. Um, <laughs> I, I want to uh, point out something about my presentation in the debate. Uh, originally, the debate was going to be, I think, I was going to do a 15-minute opening, and then it got pushed to 20 minutes because I had too much stuff. Anyway, it ended up, I requested 30 minutes. I just kept finding too many things. And even at 30 minutes, I was only able to touch the tip of every iceberg. So there was a lot I wasn't able to say. Right. And so I maybe I should do another book on preterism this time. I don't know. 
it's but, an interesting uh, thing. I mean, where you were at, I, I watched it. Um, and, you know, sans the points you and I would would disagree with, but you were hitting the, the, hitting the marks. So like, like I said, mm. the, there's three slots that church history has, has put Bible prophecy and what has been fulfilled, what is now being fulfilled, you know, where are we going? Mm-hmm. What is to be fulfilled? And that's, those three things are, you know, those are three slots that I, that I see in, in eschatology. So, um, you have also the rise of a critical school, uh, 17th, 18th, particularly 19th century with a vengeance, uh, really beginning to reread these texts. Mm-hmm. And you have a dispensationalist, fundamentalist reaction to this. And so the some of the critics were saying, you know, it looks like Jesus was appearing to say, um, depending on how you read his text, uh, that his apocalyptic coming would be glorification and bringing about the kingdom was, was a near event on the horizon. And mm-hmm. what, when, what they meant by that was eminence. In other words, if you read them closely, what they're saying is, is that Jesus himself in his lifetime, the kingdom would appear within a few months. It, it was something that was going to happen on the horizon. You'll not finish even going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. That's mm-hmm. eminence. That's, that's at any second. So when these New Testament critical scholars were utilizing the term eminence, that's what they meant by that. They didn't mean 37 years away, 70 AD. That's implausible in their mind yeah. because that's not imminent. In yeah, anyone's I, definition, 30, if I said I'm taking the trash out in 30 years, I'm about to take <laughs> the trash out soon right. in 30 years. <laughs> so no scholar will go to 70 AD and, and say that's the fulfillment of all of yeah, these. Right. They, they because they know better. They know what resurrection. Paul's doctrine of the resurrection, according to Bart Ehrman, is a bodily resurrection. That's what Paul says. Now, yeah. let's leave that or not. That's another thing. That's a matter. It, of it looks like it to me from the text. Uh, Sam, I, I wanna... as you pointed out, that didn't happen. Right. It's Seventy A.D. You can't reduce yeah. all of this language to a mere three-year war. Rome was fighting wars up in the north in Gaul and Germany. They were, and they, they, they were making yeah. escalates. They were going all over the place. Yeah. This was just a little squash event. They had to clean this up. Get these Jews, clean these <laughs> guys up, clean this. Clean. Um, Sam, I, I want to bring up something else. I watched uh, one of your debates online. I can't remember. I think it was just a few years ago. You were at a church. You had to get up on stage each oh, time. Miano, maybe? Michael Miano? That might be it, Miano. And you brought up that I had not watched any of your debates. I haven't read your book. I haven't read anything you've written. But you and I apparently came up with the same idea independently that if preterism is true and all this stuff was going to happen invisibly and only affect the Jews, what in the heck was Paul doing scaring the crap out of Felix, a Roman? Right. Yes, and exactly. going and going to Mars Hill to discuss supposedly all this intricate Old Testament stuff with people that have no knowledge of the Old Testament they whatsoever. Wouldn't care. They wouldn't right. have, yeah. And they have a care yeah, with the care. Like, oh, who cares? Yeah, yeah, and if if all of these disasters were only going to happen in Jerusalem, why would the Roman Felix be scared to death about what Paul was saying? It it doesn't it it does not fit. And that's, well, I, I, I agree with you. Totally yeah, I've, I've mentioned this too to uh, Don Preston before. I was like, okay, so you know that the Epicureans and the Stoics that that Paul's talking to, they believe that you know they they would be they would have been appalled by a actual resurrection of the body because they'd oh, yeah. be like they'd be like that's gross. What the heck are you talking about? Or pointless. What's the point? Yeah. Meat sack. Why in the world? Now, now if, if it was Don's view. And it was this whole spiritual, we're going to go and just go to heaven and it's going to be great. We're going to get a new body in heaven kind of thing. The Greeks, they would have been like, Paul, you are an amazing Jew and we love you. And we accept your, we accept that your God might be legitimate. 
That's that's what they would have done. But instead, you read that they scoffed and they were like, who the heck is this Paul guy? He's crazy. We'll listen mm-hmm. to you some more because you seem crazy and we kind of like you. But like we, w- we want to hear your crazy God, Jesus, some more, you know, um, like and so then if you yeah. we know who the Stoics were. We know who the Epicureans were. We right. have a pretty good record of and they don't talk about resurrection and the judgment at the end of the world that's right this is not Mm -hmm. on their this is not on their things that's jewish that's paul coming in the second temple today that's dead sea scroll stuff well that's not full preterism well like if anything they would have been like oh paul's talking about that they're going to go to the elysium fields if we were going by (laughs) dawn's logic which like okay he's calling abraham's bosom elysium's uh, field that's what that's what they would have like paralleled with but instead they're like no he's not doing that he's saying that we're going to get resurrected in a real physical fleshly body yeah, by the holy spirit what the heck yeah. Paul? And, 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 yeah. and Paul, weighing in. Uh, we've got somebody weighing in with the in the live chat and uh, actually there's been a few people weighing in uh, but we have josiah i can't see the live chat uh, you could see it on your phone if you get on your oh, phone, phone. <laughs> that's what i'm doing i'm not i don't i could have another panel but I'm um, too old. There's no way anyway. I can do a laptop. Um, yeah, that's multitasking. Yeah, so, so one of the one of the major um, one of the major complaints, I guess, if you want to call it a complaint, uh, from Don Preston and from his his followers, was that it seems that there were a number of Christians who were rooting for you, uh, 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 Mark. Oh yeah, because yeah, I bought um, some. Can, can I? Can I? Is the, um, can I pontificate on that? Well, just one yeah, moment. Just let me finish, please. Okay. Oh, let's I'm just sorry. Let me finish, please. Okay. And uh, it seems that that you know that they were rooting for you. Whereas, now speaking for myself personally, I thought you made some good points, and sure. I think that you know, as as far as depoliticizing the discussion, I didn't see it as you know an atheist versus a Christian. I saw it as one person making an evidential claim, or actually, I should say, a deductive logical claim. And then another person trying to make, you know, a counterclaim based on uh, evidence or shall we say lack of evidence. So I thought you made some very good, some very good points, but I thought Don made some good points too. So I wasn't trying to root for, you know, one person or the other. I was saying, well, let the best man win. Whoever has the best set of arguments. I just happen to be very much, um, you know, uh, in, not in favor with full preterism. I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's <coughs> proper apologetic and i just wanted to throw that out there because there's still you know josiah's weighing in here and he said don's charge that there were uh there were you three were on the side of the atheists seems to be true prove him wrong it looks uh all the world to me like you guys are all on the same page or scratching each other's back do you feel we're scratching your back mark uh no uh let let me comment on that because I, I ran across those comments also. Um, I went to a debate, it was in the late 90s at UCLA uh, up in Los Angeles between Michael Shermer, the famous skeptic atheist, Shermer, yeah. and Dr. Dwayne T. Gish of the- uh, Dwayne Gish, I love Dwayne Gish. And yeah. from which we get the Gish Gallup. Anyway, um, I I did debates in college. I grew up doing debates uh, against Baptist ministers and all that. And I've debated informally all over the place, you know, online, et cetera. Anyway, I went with a group of fellow atheists and we were going to see, you know, Dwayne T. Gish get his upcomus from this great Michael Shermer. Anyway, after the debate, as we're walking out, I'm talking to my fellow atheists. Shermer lost the debate. Dwayne Gish knocked him for a loop, and Shermer totally uh, did not recover. Shermer was horrible. He he did a horrible job at defending atheism, et cetera, et cetera. And I got chewed out. I got a, my AWS ripped by my fellow atheists. How dare you not support the atheists? How dare you yeah. uh, say good things about the Christian? And I, I'd had to tell them, my, my loyalty is to truth. I don't care who has the truth. I'm not going to stand up for somebody just because he's on my baseball team. That's right. You know, th- That's this right. reminds me of high school in, in the yeah. town I grew yeah, yeah, up yeah. at in, in Florida. 
there were like three major high schools and every high school thought they were the best. Why? Well, because I'm going there. That's the only reason. Right. And no, our loyalty should be to the truth. We, uh, even if Satan's speaking, I don't care. It shouldn't be to uh, our baseball team. See if I can illustrate. This is going on today in, 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 in politics. What you have today is you have, we'll say, leftism. And leftism, wokeism is just going way, way out there. And then you have these classic liberals who usually would agree with uh, Democrats left, would side with that. But they're even saying and criticizing, like Bill Maher or something, they're even criticizing this just hyper wokeism. And the left is now criticizing the left for criticizing the extreme of the left. That's not Bill Maher's point. He's just saying, look, this stuff is ridiculous. I don't care if you're left or right, but they're accusing now Bill and and, uh, and uh, several several others that are as liberal as all get out, but they're accusing him, accusing them of taking the side of the right, and they're not. It's like Alan Dershowitz. Alan Dershowitz said, "I didn't vote for Trump. I'll never vote for Trump. I voted for Hillary Clinton. I'll vote for Joe Biden, and I'll vote for Joe Biden again." But what's happening to Donald Trump is wrong. And he gets, oh, you're now you're for Donald Trump. Alan Dershowitz is a flaming liberal. He will never vote for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But it's that kind of thing. And I think it's the same because Alan Dershowitz should be able to do what Alan Dershowitz does. Follow. Look, what's right is right. and What's wrong is wrong. Mm -hmm. And but we kind of we, we we grow up trying to polarize each other. And that just shouldn't shouldn't happen. You're not taking anyone's sides. I'm not taking side of an atheist is, but when you make a good point, it's a good point. <laughs> you know, that's, it should be as simple as that. Well, I'll say this. I did pay 15 bucks to have those questions put on there. And, <laughs> and I do not like Don Preston. I will readily admit it. I hate his guts. No, I hope you're, no, I hope you're, you know, but, no, we've heard it but in my opinion, this was an atheist versus a, Sign, this could be like an atheist versus a Scientologist, as far as I'm concerned. That that was a good point. I caught that in the discussion. Yeah, yeah. 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 I mean that that's what it was to me. It's an atheist versus a Scientologist. I mean, Don's not a Scientologist, but that's what it was basically like. He's not a Christian, mm -hmm. in my opinion. So this was a fight for the truth, and whoever made the better points, I thought did a better job. And you whooped them on Acts one, and I pointed that out. Oh, yeah. They got really. They go, oh no, Conley's being so nice to the atheist. Oh, how dare him? <laughs> oh no! And it's like, well, he made a good point. What, 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 what's the problem? I think like, Acts one is the most is, is a yeah. orchard. We had as a full preterist, um, and again, I'm trying to. I'm utilizing my language skills, which at that time you know was twenty whatever years ago. But, um, but I'm proficient in Greek and, and Hebrew, but there I'm trying to utilize it. And I'm realizing, boy, we're, we're oh. yes, you can deconstruct language. Yes, you can make language. You can turn it. You can, you, you can smooth it out. You can coax it. You can massage it. You can do all these kinds of things uh, to get where it is that you want it to say. Mm -hmm. And we really had to do it on Acts 1. <laughs> to make that work because I knew in the back again my back of my head you know that's not Greek that's it's not working you're doing something. <laughs> but because you're, you're you, we are committed to the 70 AD terminus and because you're committed to that truth you have to do that that's the bias you you don't have a choice Acts 1 7 can't be beyond or after post 70 AD. It has to fit 70 AD. So you've already boxed yourself in with the terminus beginning and the terminus end. And our terminus end was, was uh, 70 AD. First Corinthians mm -hmm. 15. I don't have a choice now. It, it's 70 AD. You can't go beyond that or you're not full brothers. Yeah. What, one of the things I tried to get Don to respond to, I brought it up three times. Uh, <laughs> The third time I gave up because I know he was doing a debate trick where you just yeah. keep stalling. You don't ask yeah, yeah, the guy's yeah. question. You burn up the other guy's time. Uh, been there, done that. Don't do it anymore. Anyway, this was my point to him. My question. 
if you wanted to make it absolutely positively clear yeah, that the second coming was going to be visible, could you possibly do anything more than what is done in Acts chapter one? How would you right. improve Acts chapter one to make it a visible second coming? See, and and he, those, those three times, three times he bailed out on even trying to answer that. See, and that was a good point that you made. And he, he, he argued in bad faith. I mean, it is what it is. Um, and, and look, like, I'll say this, like during the debate, I think, I think Mark Smith respectfully, I think he kind of messed up when the, the old Testament part got brought up. I think that kind of, I, I, I got comments on that too. Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you had just been like, yeah, the old Testament is, is good. We should, you, Jesus quotes it all like you would have like been even better on that debate, honestly. So, yeah. so see people watching, I'm not being, uh, I'm not being completely for the atheist. Um, I'm just going with the truth here. So hey, um, we've got uh we've got Derek thing. from Mish Myth Vision weighing in. Ooh. Oh, uh, so Derek. You said, Derek. Uh, Derek. You said, What's uh, up, Derek? You said Don gets pissed when I say Babylon is Rome and Revelation. How are you, gents? Full preterism literally strips the meaning of everything to fit their understanding. So here's Amen, Derek. Yep. Just like I you agree. guys did, and just like I myself did, and he sees the fact that it's not a viable system of theology either. So thank you for that. Uh, I agree, that Derek. I agree 100% with that statement. Well, I was wanting to weigh in on that. You wanted to know how would you express something like, well, we have that Luke, Luke 19, <laughs> yeah. 11, um, states. And while they were hearing these things, Jesus coming uh, to Jerusalem and of the crowds thinking that the reign of God is about to presently immediately be made manifest. Mm -hmm. And the Greek there is very emphatic. That's what eminency looks like. Immediately, they thought Messiah's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming in on a lay the palms down. Psalm 118. Now keep in mind there's probably well over a hundred thousand. You know, they're all descended. This is this is the Pascha. This is the whole, mm -hmm. this is it. So it's a rock concert here. It's a it's a soccer stadium that's Hosanna. Hosanna, <laughs> kingdom of God, immediately it's going to come. And, and in a week, the same crowd kill this blasphemer. He's not the one. So that's immediacy. That's imminency. That didn't happen. Right. If hey, they Sam, thought it was going to, but it didn't. Sam, I, I want your opinion on this, Sam, because I've always conceived of imminency as something, well, it can happen at any time, but it's not on a set schedule. So if I say, well, something's imminent, if I put it on a set schedule, well, it's like we're, you know, we're getting closer to it, but it's not getting any closer to us. The kind of imminency that I'm thinking of and that I've always conceived as, well, yeah, he's at hand, but it's, it's, it's movable. You know, it's, it's, you know, today it could be at hand, but tomorrow, I think, I think E.W. Bullinger uh, put it, put it, uh, you know, very, um, very well when he said once he said that which draws near may also withdraw. And so we've got that that sort of, um, you know, the postponement theory, I know a lot of people don't don't agree with it. But the no. way I'm seeing it is there's a lot of moving parts during that first century. Yeah. And there's a lot of, you know, there's there's Peter's ministry, then there's Paul's ministry, and Paul takes over where the uh, the ministry of the 12 leave off, they were they were just preaching the, uh, you know, the sign of Jonah for that that 40 years. Uh, whereas Paul knew that they were going to, that they weren't, the Jews weren't going to reject, uh, weren't going to accept uh, uh, Jesus Christ. And so he started mm -hmm. planning for an in intermediate economy and started, you know, well, the kingdom's not coming to you. You're being translated into the kingdom. And so, um, you know, his. This, this, this is the, Go ahead. This is really the issue. And there's interesting New Testament studies, and periodicals that are, that's the last 25 years. That's swinging around realizing with like Septuagint studies and, and utilizing the, the Septuagint. So if you read in several occasions, uh, Ingus Cutius, uh, the Lord is at hand. That's found in the Septuagint on several occasions. Uh, the Lord is near those who call upon him and call upon him uh, in truth. That's the same exact phrasing that we find the Lord is near. Uh, the Lord is near Cutius Ingus to the brokenhearted and saves the Christ of spirit. Call on the Lord while he is near, Jesus comes on the scene and says, the time, using a perfect tense, which is the strongest form of a past 
that we may have in Greek if past tense is a perfect. The time has come. The kingdom is not or has drawn nigh. That's the phrasings that he's using. Another way in Greek of saying that is if you see me doing these things the, by the finger of God, the kingdom of God, perfect tense, has come upon you, is come upon you. When when is the kingdom to burst forth? The kingdom of God is esteem, present is among you. That's that changes the dynamic because that's a message that's been going on. Call on the Lord while He is near. Jesus is in appearance, and He's saying the Lord is at hand. He's there. That's literally what the the term means. At hand, my coffee cup is at hand. It's near, it's right here. It's right here. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I started I'm looking a, at it that way, and I thought that's that works. That now that would work because that's kingdom orientation and visibility of, of God's kingdom and Jesus saying the kingdom is always God's always reigned. God has always ruled. There's always been disaster in the world. That's the wrath of God. Mm-hmm. His kingdom is always, and only those with eyes to see it can see it. Well, that's Isaiah. That's not New Testament. That's Isaiah. He's sticking right with that message. He, in fact, he quotes Isaiah 6. Peter quotes Isaiah 6. Paul quotes Isaiah 6. Acts quotes Isaiah 6. Jesus quotes Isaiah 6. So there are ears to hear, not, but you can hear it. So their message, they're thinking the immediacy of the kingdom when Jesus is coming in Jerusalem. It's immediate and that that it's just not in their expectations. And I'm like, well, maybe the New Testament critical scholars have expectations. They're not reading that text. They're not reading that text. Because the dispensationalists are reacting to that. Mm -hmm. Jesus did say his coming was imminent and near. And he means what near and imminent means. But the Jews rejected him. You have this postponement mystery church period that's unforeseen of the prophets. So they're even dealing with near in that aspect. And the full preterist does the same thing as the critical scholar does. But the difference is the critical scholar, if you're going to interpret near in a temporal sense, they're right. And Jesus is a failed prophet. Because you can't get 37 years out of 70 AD and near. There's not. I've talked to so many Greek scholars on this, and they said, there's no way. That's why we'll never go down that pipe. Yes, right. 70 AD was important, but it's not the end of the world. Uh, yeah. Sam, Sam, uh, if you can see this, please, yeah. please email me so we can communicate with each other via email. Uh, I would like to pick your brain regarding Greek uh, items. I'm not a Greek scholar. I don't speak Greek, et cetera, et cetera. I would love to be able to uh, get your expertise on it. That's JC, not, not? N-O-T. Yeah, oh, N-O-T. Christ, not for me. That could be a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but, uh, okay, what Frost, will, yeah. but what Frost was saying, you know, I used to think that way too, that it was just um, the time text have to be like this or that time text for everything. But like, like he just said, and, and father Stephen day young, I, he's a great, if you ever read him, you'll like him. Um, He was bringing this up in his revelation podcast the other day. And he was like, well, you read this in revelation where it says the time approaches in chapter one. And it's like, he's coming quickly. Well, time doesn't um, time doesn't mean you know, like what Frost was just saying, it, it can mean it, and it can mean something different than an extension in space and time. So, like, is Christ near? Yeah, he's with me right now. Uh, you know, he's uh, it like so that that just proves it already that there's a different way to look at it. And like like Sam was saying, the the Greeks, none of them had a problem with this. Like, you read Chrysostom and all these people that knew Cohen Greek. I mean. To most of them, they're reading like this is Shakespeare almost. So they're they're just like, yeah, this this is this is what this means. <laughs> like they're not they're not going like, oh man, I think Jesus might have been a failed Messiah because well, yeah. he said he was coming this generation and this time text here. Oh man, you know they weren't doing that. They were like, they were like, no, this yeah. this means I think this. Gotta be, way, I think it's know? gotta be collated. The the time text, everything else has to be collated with with Matthew chapter twenty three verse thirty nine. You will not see me till henceforth until you say, "Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord." 
And in Acts chapter 3, verses 19 uh, through 21, repent ye therefore be converted. The times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, that the Jewish nation has to repent. You know, Moses had two advents. Um, he had an, his first advent, he was rejected by his brethren, and then he went into Egypt, got himself a Gentile wife. Then he came back after 40 years and they accepted him. And that's when he went, you know, his mission before Pharaoh. Uh, so we have these things set out in, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament types. Uh, there's no two, two advents mentioned in the Old Testament, only in topology. It's in the New Testament that we get the two, the two comings. So to me, man, it's, you know, and I, like I said, I felt I, yeah. I came across some very good books after I left full preterism, uh, some extremely good books by some extremely good, um, you know, writers. And I haven't changed my views in 15 years because I already know that, you know, everything that's happening in the world today is happening for a reason. Uh, you know, it, it seems to be playing out uh, according to, you know, what the prophecy scholars and teachers ha have said, then how it would play out. Um, so I have to go by that. And, you know, if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm going to be wrong, but, you know, I'm in good company. So, yeah, that's why I've expanded my, I, I've expanded. So in church history, every generation thinks they're the terminal generation, you know, the second century, third century, you know, they, that they do. And analyzing all of that and looking at why were they, oh, uh, World War II, you had people running around, you had Hitler's Antichrist, Mussolini, you got it all coming together, World War, that's horrible. World War II was horrible. World War One was horrible. Oh, yeah. uh, and so I started thinking, you know, why? Well, be, be, because it is. It, 13th century, 12th century, 9th century. It, it is. It, it fits the pack. What's the pattern? A state will write. You see the patterns here. Uh, Hitler's was nothing new. We've seen this before. Totalitarian regimes exterminating and doing all that they do. And everyone's got a lockstep in conformity to the state master. Uh, that's Rome. That's that's how this this is. And there's a good wealth of material in the historicist view that began to understand that these things are these are patternings. And if I understand last days correctly, that's not just the the last. I don't accept the dispensationalist meaning of last days. As only a few short years until the end of, until the end of history, last days can be like the former times, and that was thousands of years. Why can't last days be? This is the last times. This is the last. What's the last era going to look like? Well, persecution, mocking, earthquakes, tribulations, wars, nations against nations. Jesus is actually announcing to his disciples, "This gener your generation is going to come and go. You're not the terminal generation." You're going to see wars, rumors of wars, tribulation. You're even going to see Jerusalem fall. But Lance really helped, hammers this, and he helped me hammer this. You're going to see all this stuff go on, but the end is not yet. Right. And that is the controlling motif of Matthew 24. You're going to see this, this, this. You're going to see all this. But the end that you're asking about, that's not yet. Well, when is that? I don't even know. I think Jesus right. is saying, I, I don't know. And hey, uh, Sam, that to me solves a lot of problems. Sam, I, I want to tell you that I agree with you on your comments about Bill Maher. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Bill. <laughs> I like uh, Bill. Bill's a love-hate guy. Love him, you he, hate him, you love him. Yeah, him. he's getting a lot of flack from both sides. And again, whatever is truth is what I'm trying to advance. Uh, I'm not for anybody's uh, particular team. Uh, I would like to be able to share a little bit about uh, the Old Testament and my comments in the debate. Is it possible to do a screen share? Certainly is. Yeah. You get you set up. Okay. Should be able to if you have that. Okay, paper. sir, you're all set. Okay. Uh, is uh, my slide showing? I don't see it. I don't see it. You don't. Okay, let me see about uh, display settings. Now I subscribe to Zoom, so I have a setting at the bottom of my tab that allows me to screen share. 
Well, try try it now, Mark. Try it now. Well, I have it up. Let me uh, slideshow options. I you, than, uh, you did share screen, right? Yeah, I'm trying to. Well, let yeah. me let me go back to uh, Zoom and share screen. There we go. Okay, now it should be showing. It's not showing. I don't see, see anything. Uh, let me try it again. Let me let me hit you again. Uh, okay. Try it again, sir. All right. I'm about to screen. There it goes. Okay. Oh, okay. About to get this. The screen sharing is near. <laughs> okay. Oh, let God. me do. Share. There we go. Okay. It should be max maximum yeah. for everybody. Okay. Uh, but besides the fact that I brought up that more than half of the books in the New Testament are not written to Jews or, or necessarily concerning Judaism, I thought that was a significant point that Don sort of passed over. Uh, these are some other thoughts on why I don't think in the New Testament church uh, expertise in the Old Testament was required. Let me read this here. Uh, this is re regarding nowadays. Preterists nowadays have to go out of their way to explain to American Christians who can read and even their own Old Testaments. They own their own Old Testaments. Most people back then did not own a Bible of Scripture. Manuscripts were extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, that the second coming was not to be visible. Even with a lifetime of Bible study, it is not obvious to them. Why? Because a simple and plain reading of the New Testament says it will be visible. If PhD levels of Old Testament knowledge are required, everyone is going to hell then. So even modern Christians who own their own Bibles, they can read for the most part. It's not obvious to them. They're not picking up that everything was supposed to be invisible. Let me make another point here about the unlearned. These newly Christianized pagans still eating meat offered to idols were for the most part illiterate and not educated in the minute details of the Old Testament. Given that, they would have taken Paul and Jesus at their word without a thousand pages of Old Testament intricate details to color their opinions. Uh, when the writer of the book of Acts said that Jesus' second coming will be visible, they would have taken that at face value. They wouldn't have run to the Old Testament uh, to dig up a thousand verses to detail it. And Mark, I think I see your point. Before when I was hearing you, the immediacy of hearing you at that debate, it sounded like you were deprecating the Old Old Testament, and that's how Don took it. Now that I'm that's actually reading you slowly here, you're not doing that. You're, I, no. I think I see your point. If right. Paul is not, not teaching the Old Testament, he's quoting it at every, but he's teaching it to people who do not have this in-depth uh, yeah. theophonic, Christophon, you know, they're not, they're, you know, so when he says visible, he's talking to Greeks. When they hear the word visible, they mean it. it resurrection of the body. That's they, they're thinking Greek. They're not yeah. thinking any of the. Yeah, they, they the understand. So, that. And that is true. In full preterism, you have to build this elaborate kind of thing before you can get into uh, a common sense understanding of what First Corinthians fifteen is saying to every liberal conservative scholar that's out there. Right. They're in agreement that yeah, Paul's mm -hmm. talking about resurrection of the body. Here. But in Max King's view, Don Preston's view, you have to buy into this elaborate collective body, Old Testament, Hebrew mindset, collectivism kind of thing. And then you can read 1 Corinthians 15 as if these right. Corinthians would have understood corporate body, covenantal, Adamic, old self. No, they wouldn't. Have. Well, well what, have what, you that need, at all. what what you need so that's a is good point. I see what you're saying now. Yeah, you, you, you need a PhD from yeah, yeah, yeah. Vision yeah. International University <laughs> <laughs> right. to get to this fake, depth. You need that fake honorary degree from Vision, yeah. Okay, one, one more point here. Apostle 
to the Gentiles. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. As such, he wouldn't have counted on his ex-pagan converts to have PhD levels of Old Testament competencies to preterize all of the direct promises of a visible second yeah, yeah, yeah. coming. Okay. Agreed. Yeah, I would agree with that now. So you're, those well, you're, are my points. You're not against PhD levels of Old Testament. No, no. <laughs> yeah, because I, well, I thought you were saying, I'm like, but this guy's a scholar. Why would he? He's, yeah, well, the funniest New thing Testament to me, studies are immersed in the Old Testament. Old right. Testament. Well, the funniest. I get your point. Like, yes, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah, like, like the funny thing to me, too, is like, you'll hear Don Preston talk about the Hebraic mindset. But then, yeah. you know, I, I just I just like I just had a discussion with a bunch of uh, Jewish people. I, I got into their Hebrew Bible study. I've got it on my uh, on my my YouTube channel. Right. Um, well, I, I've asked them before. I was like, so y'all read the New Testament. They're like, yeah, we've read it. I'm like, so does Jesus ever say he's going to come back invisibly? And and what do you think about Paul's resurrection? They're like, well, it's just like ours. I'm like, I've heard and, that. And I'm like, well, what is y'all's like? They're like, well, God, the father, he'll raise the dead fleshly. One of the benedictions. Like, yeah, just like One Paul says. And Paul's a Pharisee. He says it himself in Acts during the uh, trial. So, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, and I've read Alan Segal. I've read all these Second Temple scholars. And they're all like, yeah, the, the, we, 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 disagree with the, uh, we disagree with the idea that Christ is the second power of heaven. That he's the messiah but this is what he's teaching and it's not like it's not hebraic <laughs> like like the you're old testament good points you're making some good yeah. points uh mark i agree with you and another thing that i have i've observed is if they were uh speak paul was say communicating in code you would most likely have you know um uh, you know, a paper trail of commentaries throughout, mm -hmm. you know, early, especially during early churches, yeah. you know, purporting yeah. to crack yeah. the code, whereas there's really not, you know, any kind of code. So I think it's, you know, I think if the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. Uh, he was talking about a literal visible coming. Now, why it didn't happen? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I have my views. I'm sure Sam has his, uh, Lance may have his, uh, but regardless, I, it I've, I've got mine. <laughs> of course, yeah. uh, and, and it didn't happen. I think we can all agree. I think we all agree that it didn't happen. So, uh, you know, what what Christianity is going to make of that, and what, of course, people who are thinking about leaning towards atheism, what they're going to make of that may be something totally different. But I think it's good that we have these dialogues because I really don't know, um, you know, why more people are going towards atheism, and it seems to be offering a better solution to some of their problems, maybe than maybe not. Uh, so something to think about for sure. I think a well, lot of it's it, intellectual. It, I, I mean, in I think a lot case, of it's, oh, I'm sorry, Mark. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. In, in my case, I didn't go off into atheism. I was, as a Christian, studying the second coming. I mean, it was, nobody would have been able to convince me that I was trying to become an atheist. I, I was studying something that I always wanted to study since I was a kid. Mm-hmm. And it, it wasn't like, gee, I want to become an atheist so I can uh, sin and do whatever. Right. No. And I didn't become an atheist because anybody hurt my feelings or I was mad at God or any of these things. I, I became an atheist because, to me, the evidence seemed to point to the fact that Jesus was a false prophet. And I refused to worship a false prophet. I don't, I don't care about even if you walked on water. I can't go that far. That is why I became an atheist. That, that, you know, I've got I've got family members that are atheists, and they were raised in a Catholic, you know, in a Catholic Catholic schools. You know, Catholic, they went to Catholic mass every uh, every weekend, every Sunday rather, and uh, you know now they don't believe in God. And I've been in circ, you know, going cool. around and around in circles with year uh, for years with some of them, and uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, I don't know. I think a lot of it may be, you know, not not having the right the right study materials. But then again, I don't want to speak down, you know, talk down to anybody like they didn't have the right study materials. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, I think, has to do with either believe it or you're not or not. You know, either believe it or Get not. Get into the area of epistemology. Yeah, you either believe it or you're not. I, I, I've never heard. I've, I've got 
friends who used to be atheists who became Christians because the atheism left them with nothing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, eat, drink, be merry, die, get it over with. Well, you know, they, they weren't die really already. Atheists. And they couldn't get around that. So in their minds, there is a subjectivity. I don't, I don't like conversion uh, testimonies being used as proofs. I used to be an atheist, and now I'm a Christian. Uh, Sam, Sam, and you're not Sam. doing. It. I don't think you're doing. It. Sam, Sam, they they weren't real atheists. The no true Stossman fallacy. Well, <laughs> here we go again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I well, some that I well. It, you get into that. There's some atheists that I've read, that, and they're pretty. These are Harvard guys. Um, you know, they don't have a real problem with euthanasia or any of that kind of stuff. They don't have any issues with that, um, okay. because you know, you want to. We have a show maybe on 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 the aspects of atheism, you know, those kinds of things. That would be an interesting, an interesting um, kind of show. But anyway, you know. For the betterment of the human race, mongoloids, what good are they? You know, mercifully, let's let's tuck them away because they're just, they're, you know, why have I them? I got a quick question for you, Mark. But anyway, that's a. Uh, I just you know, want to ask you a quick question. Um, yes. I, I know you're not a, you're not a Christian, but considered you know. Uh, simply as an ethical system, would you say that the Sermon on the Mount subserves a purpose? Uh, conduces perhaps to a more uh, stable society. I mean, we remember when we were children and our parents would say, you know, kids be nice if you have any siblings. Yeah. Uh, do you think that the Sermon on the Mount, I know there's a lot of thinkers and there's a lot of great um, artists and, uh, and writers and thinkers who have um, not necessarily endorsed, you know, the, the package of Christianity, but uh, those who, uh, you know, like Leo Tolstoy and others, they endorsed Christ's ethical teachings as conducive to a, to a better life and to a happier life on earth. Uh, do you think that the, that the ethical system of Christianity is still worth following, even though it may not, um, may not lead us to a true, to a, well, to a true God or any God? Uh, let, let, let me, uh, answer this with a actual life experience. I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I was in the uh, li one of the libraries at uh, the University of Michigan, beautiful campus, beautiful building, a million books. It was uh, like being in heaven for me. Anyway, I was a Christian and I was standing at an elevator a freight elevator because the regular one wasn't working to go downstairs and leave. And there were these two gentlemen standing next to me that didn't look legitimate, like actual students. Anyway, got on the elevator with these people. My inner voice was saying, don't get on the elevator. I was like, okay, I can't prejudge people. I got on the elevator. I got the crap beaten out of me. I got mugged in the elevator. And I didn't fight back because I turned the other cheek. I was a Christian. And afterwards, uh, people were telling me, you know, you're lucky you didn't get killed or stabbed or anything like that. But I say all that to say this. I don't agree with a lot of the ethics that Jesus talks about in the Gospels. For example, turn the other cheek. Uh, I think if a society took that as one of their founding principles, they would be conquered by Canada uh, within a month. I think I uh, no, that, no apologies to the Canadians. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're just nice people. Uh, but things like turn the other cheek, things like don't lay up for the future, just live for today, that would land a person in the poorhouse and uh, get mugged all the time. I mean, some of this stuff was good. It wasn't original. Uh, you know, do unto others. That was being said 900 years before Jesus walked the earth. Uh, so I'm not that impressed with his uh, ethics. And I, I know Christians have explanations for turn the other cheek and all that. Uh, I actually put out a track. I, I'm an evangelical atheist. I, I write tracks for, you know, promoting atheism but this had to do with matthew chapter five where if anybody asks you for something give it to them 
And I would walk up to Christians that were street preaching, hand them my track that has a verse big there and say, give me, give me all the money in your wallet. And of course they'd refuse. And I'd say, well, you just proved you're not a real Christian. So don't talk to me about Christ. Uh, but that's another thing, a part of his ethics that would bankrupt a family. If you were under obligation to give everything that people asked for, you'd be broken homeless. You wouldn't even have a shopping cart because some guy would ask you for that. So no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Jesus's ethics. That's a fair well, enough. Would you, would you allow, um, because you're, 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 and that interpretation is you're not alone. There's Christians that have interpreted it. Sarah from Rose said way. something similar to that. So you know, there's the George <laughs> yeah. Fox and Quakers. There's that. So there's, but yet, again, as a scholar, there's, there's other explanations. explanations of that as well. So you want to look at all of, you know, I know. Say, yeah, that's what Jesus meant. What Jesus meant is basically, if you follow Jesus in Jesus's own mind, because he would have been aware if someone's going to rape your wife, let him have at it. Don't do anything. Is that what he's saying? Just, you know, let just lay down. Because we see other things that are said as well. So you try to, you know, because he would have been aware of that. But yet, at the same time, he, he has a collection for the poor. Judas Iscariot's holding the purse. But he has a collection going on, and he's obviously they're carrying. They got to eat. <laughs> so well, I'm not it, saying he was so consistent. Is this is, is what Jesus that. saying a maxim, maximalist, absolute, no exceptions, ironclad, written in stone, every application, no exceptions? I that's hard to read. That's I think we're assuming that going into what he's saying. But in general. Have I given to people on street corners and stuff who've come up and, hey, Brett, do you have a coat? Yeah, I have. Have I given my coat? I've given a coat um, in general. Um, have I been in squaffs where someone has slapped me and I'm, brother, I don't want a problem. Look, uh, you know, look, we're just trying to get home. We want to get home. If they're coming at me with a knife and threatening my life, I'm, I'm stomping guts, biting noses, ripping ears off, and crushing their skull into the ground. In the name of Jesus, I hope you know God, <laughs> because you're you're getting ready to meet him. And that's legitimated in the scriptures. That's Exodus 22. That's you have a there, right. There, there are contradictions, and I'm aware of that. Uh, it's not a contradiction. Well, it's just, it's well, it's, it's, I see it. even. it's it's situational ethics. What, what yeah. Fletcher was saying. It's it's yeah. it depends on the situation. Um, see, one, one advantage of me being an ex-Christian is. Everything doesn't have to fit together nicely in the Bible. It can say things from several viewpoints that quite, jive quite with true. each other. That's quite true. And, and, I and it does do that. Before. And I, that, again, I think that's a mark of of, of a, a scholarly reading of the scriptures is understanding there's there's different situations that Jesus is talking to, who he's talking to. Um. You know, in general, this is we should live peaceful, peaceful lives. If someone hits you, my immediate reaction is, "All right, brother, let's go on. We're going to knock it. Let's just go." My immediate reaction is, "Is hey, 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 let's let's let's, let's yeah. bring this down." Well, and I've I've, I've actually I've, done that in bars before. I've actually I've actually got in between a fight and say, "Guys, you don't you know let's let's settle this in a different way. I'll buy you, I'll buy you around. You know, let's." Well, peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. So it's, yeah. it's, well, guys, it's, about, uh, it's been about a half, it's been about an hour and a half. Did you want to start wrapping it up? Um, yes, I have to, but I would love to discuss more on this level with Mark on these levels on another show. Of course, uh, that's again, that would be look, nice. Full preterism is false, I think. Yeah. People, and Mark, I think you handled me. yourself quite well there, and you made some great, thank great you. points. Thank you. Uh, so, and I appreciate you coming on, Mark. I just want to ask, do you have anything, any last words to say? Uh, yes, to I do. Those, uh, watching the video, there you go. Go to Amazon. Plan on getting that. Buy the book. If if nothing else, it has a ton of good data in it that any anybody could use to talk to Christians or whoever. 
Yeah. And that's uh, Amazon. I, you can get that anywhere. Amazon. Just I didn't even realize Jesus has the sunglasses Jesus. on there. Yeah. Go to go to Amazon. Look for Broken Promises Jesus, and it should pop up. All right. Well, that's wonderful. Well, I, I want to thank that. everybody for uh, showing up tonight. I also want to thank uh, Mark for coming out, and also Dr. Sam yep. Frost for coming out. It's a pleasure Thanks. to see you gentlemen both. Uh, I will be back. I should. Nice be meeting you, Mark. Uh, nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Me. I don't have any good words for Lance. I never have any good words. <laughs> that's true. Uh, <laughs> Do my outro here. Lance, good good meeting you, Lance. Good meeting you too. So I'll be back tomorrow. I got another show. Uh, I believe I'm gonna be dealing with uh doing one with David Preston tomorrow. I'm still in talks with him. Also got another one coming up on Saturday. I'm gonna have a Eric Hall again. Uh, we're gonna be going uh, further into what we've been dealing with. Uh as a matter of fact, I've got one coming up Sunday. So uh keep keep an eye on those. And uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, coming out tonight. I want to thank everybody for watching the show. I want to thank you for weighing in with your thoughts, your observations, uh, your critiques. Everything is helpful and everything is noticed. And uh, I want everybody to have a wonderful evening. Have a safe and relaxing weekend. Uh, take care and we'll talk to you soon.